The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Power and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. On July 1st, General Robert E. Lee invades Gettysburg to fight the most important battle of the American Civil War. For three days, a bloody battle is fought between the Union and Confederate Army to prevent the Southern forces from marching into Washington, D.C. Favored by the high ground, the Union is able to hold on, eventually pushing Lee back towards Virginia. The dead are many, and their souls still linger, raiding one of the ghost capitals of the world. On September 23rd, hosts T. Fox Dunham and Phil Thomas invade the town of Gettysburg and fall upon the tour headquarters of noted paranormal historian and folklorist Mark Nesbitt. For two hours they talk with Mark, telling ghost stories and fighting supernatural technical problems. Eventually, Mark defeats Fox and Phil, driving them back in their show, What Are You Afraid Of?, to the city of Philadelphia, breeding one of the best ghost podcasts. We finally made it. Yes, we did. We are in Gettysburg. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, so, how are you, Phil? I'm good, Fox. How are you doing? Came down last night. Yeah, did you? I came down last night. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, how'd it go? Met with Mark. Oh, it was great. Uh, I ran into Tom. Okay. And uh, walked around a little bit, had a beer, uh, met with Mark mm -hmm. for the first time. Uh, right. I wanted to talk to him a little bit today. And uh, yeah, it was a great time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed at the Colton. Okay. And. Uh, I just love it here. It's it's like one of my favorite places to come. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you you guys came in today, correct? Yeah, we came in this morning. Popped in. Uh, we drove up this morning. Of course, there was some traffic. We were just in North Carolina, <laughs> and then you know we came on up. We drove up this morning, and it's just you know North Carolina to here. It's <laughs> right. I know it was well. Not we, yeah, I know we, we stopped over and slept somewhere, but it was yeah. a bit of a you know <laughs> exhausting trip. Where'd you guys stay? Uh, down in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a Sheridan hunt. Yeah, it was a Sheridan. She was doing job interviews. But this is actually episode 60. Can you believe it? We I cannot are at, believe it. We are at 60 <laughs> episodes. It's incredible. Gettysburg Ghosts. Yes. Yeah, we did an episode last Halloween, and we brought on Ghost to Story, Mr. Ghost of Gettysburg, Mark Nesbitt, and he is here with us today. How are you, Mark? Just fine, Fox. Oh, wow, fantastic. And uh, we are at your lovely shop. Thank you for inviting us. This is a wonderful place to do no a broadcast. Problem. No yeah. problem. So we're here to hear some of your ghost stories, play some of your recorded archive ghost stories from our voice actors, play some music. Uh, we got a great story from James Chambers. It's going to be a good two hours. Hello, authors. T. Fox Denham and Phil Thomas come to haunted Penhurst Asylum on Friday, October 6th and Friday the 13th to host an evening of ghost stories and horror on What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. Penhurst is one of America's oldest, most haunted sites investigated by sci-fi ghost hunters and ghost adventure and they're broadcasting live on most nights. 
Max and Phil will be dressing up as their favorite ghouls to talk to the crowds, interview paranormal historians, and share the many spooky tales surrounding the 112 acres of the old mental estate. So come out with your ghost stories on October 6th and the 13th to help them celebrate their countdown to Halloween 2017 at Penhurst Asylum. For more information, visit the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com Happy Halloween! Countdown to Halloween. Are you haunted by shadow people in the middle of the night? Do you secretly love all things creepy and spooky, enjoying ghost stories and horror fiction from the best storytellers? Do you have a true ghost experience you want to share, but no one will believe you? If yes, listen to The Professionals on What Are You Afraid of? Horror Paranormal Show, Friday nights at 9pm on Para-X Radio and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What are you afraid of on Para-X? Our creepy and demented hosts are on call to provide you with all your spooky needs with true ghost stories, interviews, indie music, and new horror fiction. We are ready ready to to scare scare you. Para X. Quality warning. This podcast often records in the field to gather the best in paranormal materia from witnesses. Often, we cannot control the quality of sound in this environment, such as you may hear distortions or perhaps the occasional moaning. But then again, we're not about control, are we? Embrace the chaos. Mark, how long have you been around? Around Gettysburg yeah. or around this wall? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Both. Um, I heard a couple hundred years. Well, Gettysburg. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, it depends on how many or... past lives you want to talk about. Yeah. But <laughs> um, no, Gettysburg, I came to Gettysburg uh, in 1970 mm-hmm. to work for the National Park Service as a park ranger here. And then shortly after that, five or six years after that, then I, I started my own freelance writing business and research business. And. Um, uh, that's when I started the writing seriously, you know, uh, and, re- and and collecting things. But the, um, uh, so I've been around for quite a while, around Gettysburg at any rate. Mm. So. <laughs> Very nice. Right. Okay. How, how did uh, your interest in the supernatural begin? Well, well, Phil, you know, everybody's everybody's interested in, you know, ghosts and, and, and the hereafter. I mean, from the time we're kids, we hear ghost stories. Mm-hmm. But uh, my uh, specific interest in Gettysburg started when I was a park ranger here because I, being the bachelor out there, they moved me to different houses. The okay. houses out on the park are lived in by park rangers for security right. reasons. Right. And um, I had had strange experiences in, in virtually every single one of them. Mm. And so, uh, and I think it really kind of struck home when I was living in the National Cemetery Lodge, okay. you know, that beautiful brick structure in the in the National Cemetery there, and we um, had uh, I was I was I remember fixing uh, lunch, mm-hmm. and I just finished lunch, and I walked into um, the uh, kitchen to take my uh, um, uh, dishes out, and uh, I I heard a baby cry. Oh, okay. And I'm the only one in the house. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? And apparently, I, 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 I kind of casually, I tried to think what it was. Mm-hmm. You know, I was right. in pipes. No, it's not the pipes. It's a house settling. No, um, it was a baby crying. Mm-hmm. And so I went to um, uh, work the next day, and apparently I mentioned it in the coffee room. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, you need to talk to such and such who lived there before you. Oh. Yeah. So I talked to her, and sure enough, uh, she had heard babies cry. Really? And so the interesting thing was is that the cemetery lodge is just a couple doors away from the old orphanage. Oh, okay. Where, where the, the, the orphanage for the Civil War, uh, you know, orphans made by the Civil War. Right. So um, it, it all kind of, you know, two and two went together. And, and, it, and that's what really got me interested, that personal experience. And then the, the verification of that experience with someone else. Right. Um, that's when my interest got started. I started collecting um, all the ghost stories I could, talking to old, older park rangers, getting mm-hmm. their ghost stories, and eventually that became the first Ghost of Gettysburg book. 
Wonderful. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great story. So that's a great story. And I guess you never really found out who the, the baby was, the identity. And no, that, I can you, only assume that it may have been one of the children because the story of the orphanage is, is, is a tragic one. The very first, um, matron was, was very sweet and nice. Then they got someone out of a Dickens novel, you know, <laughs> Mrs. Carmichael, who <laughs> would put the kids out in the cold weather and make them stand uh, out there for punishment. She uh, had a couple enforcers that, that used to beat the kids and stuff. So um, that's probably where, if there's a remnant, uh, a remnant haunting of, uh, of, of, of the orphanage, it would probably be a child. And it could have been even more than one, you never know. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, there, there was... Very harsh conditions back then. They did things much differently. Yeah, than they we did. do today. We don't treat our, our kids like that. Luckily, you know. Yeah. Well, not all of us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so sure about what will happen with mine, but um, <laughs> we are in Gettysburg. It happened. We are with Mark Nesbitt on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show, Episode 60, Gettysburg Ghosts, as part of our countdown to Halloween 2017. Little Round Top, researched and written by Mark Nesbitt. In 1981, on the 118th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, a large reenactment was planned. During the last days of June and the first sultry day of July 1981, reenactors from all over the country converged on Gettysburg to live, eat, sleep, and fight near these hallowed grounds. Being the way they are, the reenactors, as much to enjoy their hobby, were here to commemorate the brave men and women who sacrificed their lives at Gettysburg to make this nation what it is today. A friend of mine, who is as serious a reenactor as one can get, who, in fact, actually makes the reproduction uniforms from originals that he has studied, was participating in the mock battle of July 2nd, 1981. The day was incredibly hot and humid, even for Gettysburg in July. The men were soaked to the skin and covered with grime and powder stains from the reenactment. But as uncomfortable as they were, they seemed to appreciate it, since that's the way it was for their ancestors who fought 118 years before. The day was drawing to a close, and camp duties were over. My acquaintance and a comrade, still dressed in uniforms of Union soldiers, took a walk on the battlefield to cool off in the misty twilight. They reached Little Round Top, the scene exactly 118 years before of some of the most savage fighting in the Civil War, now part of the gentle National Military Park where visitors came to ponder. They climbed the small hill and sat on the slope to watch the sunset magnificently over the South Mountains to the west. Being familiar with the battle, they probably could have named some of the men who fought there on the slope before them 118 years ago, almost to the hour. No doubt they thought of Joshua Chamberlain and his rugged men from the rocky coast and forests of Maine, who fought with the desperation of men in the last ditch, which is exactly where they were at the very end of the entire Union line, and died that way as well. From the scrub brush just down the slope, the two men heard a rustling and saw a soldier of the Federal Persuasion emerge from the bushes on the rocky hillside and begin wearily climbing toward them amid the lengthening shadows and cooling air. Hello, friends, he said with an excellent northern twang. Mighty hot fight there today, weren't it? My friend and his associates agreed as to the heat of the day, as well as smiling at the authenticity of the man's kit. Sweat stained his indigo hat, and black grime still blackened his mouth and teeth from where he had bitten numerous cartridges to pour their powder down the barrel of his musket. They were about to compliment him upon his authenticity when he reached into his cartridge box and pulled out a couple of rounds of ammunition. Here, he said. Take these. You boys may need them tomorrow. He gave them a strange, wizened look, then turned and began making his way back down the slope of Little Round Top. My friend and his companion watched for a few seconds as the stranger began his descent of the slope back into the evening. Rolling the cartridges over in his hand, my friend looked at them more closely. 
and remarked at the incredible amount of work it must have taken to produce such authentic looking cartridges. They seem to be original, tied, folded correctly with just a hint of beeswax for lubrication, in every way seemingly an exact replica of Civil War era ammunition. Then he felt the mini ball inside each one. Reenactors are forbidden to carry either ramrods or live rounds onto the field of a reenactment for safety purposes, yet these contained the mini ball rolled within. They looked down the slope on Little Round Top into the Valley of Death, but could no longer see the soldier. A few yards down the slope, he had simply vanished into the gathering pale mist which at Gettysburg have that distinctive shape of long, strung-out lines of infantry mustered in formation. My friend still has the ancient rounds of ammunition, treasured yet somewhat confusing mementos of a small hole between worlds, a tiny glitch in the seemingly, but often illusory, continuity of time. Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham, published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to mercy. Notorious is a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking up the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face. They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow, then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking. And like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Fangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them. And now, it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mayo. Mm-mm-mm. So salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense. Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of a novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows, visit electronicmediacollective.com. Well, we are back with Mark Nesbitt. And Phil is here. Prone to Penhurst. Oh, I can't wait for that. One. I know. We are going down to Penhurst. We'll be there gonna... a couple times. Yeah. 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 yeah, we'll be there for the month of October. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. Have you ever been down to Penhurst, Mark? I have not. Mm-hmm. I have not. I've sort of been busy with Gettysburg but that's, <laughs> and other places, but uh, Penhurst I have not been to. Well, there's a lot to do, you know, in Gettysburg. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can see why you spend all your time here. And you have some remarkable books. The Ghosts of Gettysburg, Civil War Ghost Trails. He's got seven collections. I mean, it, it's just incredible, right? Isn't it? That's a, it's a never-ending, it's seemingly, seemingly a never-ending source for uh, ghost stories and uh, the paranormal. Uh, the, the most recent book uh, that I did was called uh, "Cursed in Virginia." Okay. It's not all um, ghost stories. So there's some other uh, strange things. You know, a lot of people don't realize that um, Jamestown; those people were in such bad shape. Uh, you know, it seems to be that, and Williamsburg is another strange place. Mm-hmm. But at any rate, um, there's lots to write about. Never a dull moment. Why is Gettysburg so haunted? Well, you know, there's a there are a lot of different theories on why ghosts linger, why spirits linger. Obviously, 
violence, mm-hmm. um, and it didn't get any more violent than the three days that the armies fought here. Um, 51,000 casualties in three days, mm. which is boils down. They didn't fight for, 20, for three days straight. They fought for about 24 hours. And if you do a little simple division, you find out that that's one man being struck every two seconds. And so that's an incredible rate of violence um, in, in when they started fighting. And then uh, you also had uh, many unconsecrated burials. Every man who died here at Gettysburg was buried at least twice. First where he was uh, killed, and then later on they exhumed the bodies, and the Union soldiers, they took them up to the National Cemetery, and then of course in uh, the 19th of November, 1863, those graves were consecrated by mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address, and the ministers and everything. That's just the Union soldiers. Though. The Confederates uh, remained out on the battlefield until 1870, 1871, when they were finally exhumed and taken south, and then they were laid to rest in um, kind of like national cemeteries of the south. That's when the words were said, and, and they could rest in peace. And yet, they still haven't gotten all the bodies. Wow. Probably anywhere really? from, yeah, anywhere from uh, 500 to 1,200 wow. or 1,300. That's that's well, the wow. most recent one they found was in 1996 uh, or 97. And so, it, you know, I mean, it, there are places where they were, you know, the guys were buried, uh, the battle lines moved, none of their soldier friends ever got back, some farmer put a little headboard up, it rained, the cows came in, trampled the grave, knocked over the headboard, and they're gone. Wow. I didn't, realize they, were, I didn't realize they were buried after that long, 63 to 70. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. that the Confederates, you know, that well, the war lasted until '65, so that's mm-hmm. two years that they're gonna, they're not gonna take, right. do anything to take care of them. And then the South was so poor they couldn't. Uh, after the war, they didn't have enough money or anything to try and um, get their soldiers back until right. until five, six years later. So it was mm-hmm. pretty sad for the Confederates. Yeah, that that's wow, <laughs> and I can imagine how some of them would be restless. Yeah, and that's that's one of the theories, you know, um, that and also yeah, another theory is that there's so many buildings here that were that remain from the battle, including this one, and uh, out of some 400 buildings that were here at the time of the battle in Gettysburg, 200 remain, mm-hmm. and we actually have more uh, Civil War buildings in the town of Gettysburg than they have out on the National Park. They have about really? I guess 80 or so out on the National Park, so we have more in town. Mainly because of a of a preservation effort years ago, mm-hmm. but also people are kind of, you know, it's not like a big city like Philadelphia when you when you need room, you just tear down an old building and put a new one up. Right. But this building that we're in now, in fact, this room that we're in now mm-hmm. was probably occupied by Georgia soldiers. We have narrowed it down really? to Georgia. Yeah, they were the nearest uh, soldiers to this area. We know for a fact by um, individuals who were in the house at the time of the battle. Uh, a mother and a daughter, um, that they were occupied by Confederate soldiers on this, where we are right now. They really? Probably, the guys are probably, you know, exhausted, tired, lying around or sitting around in this room. Wow. Um, sharpshooters may have been upstairs. We know that a Union soldier, a Northern soldier, was hidden by these uh, two women up in the attic. Okay. And this is how we know there were Confederates, because when the Confederates took it over, they had to... They had to sneak him out, mm-hmm. um, probably across the balcony up there into, into the house next door. Oh, geez. So, and I was like a, I was just admiring the, um, well, not admiring, but I was looking at the uh, the bullet holes on the side of the Farnsworth house. Right, there are still, bullet holes all, yeah. we have a couple in, in, in here, right, up on the right. mm-hmm. second floor, and then we have actually one inside in one of the doors. Um, the bullet apparently came through from one of the windows. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. It's like the Jenny Wade story. Yeah. It came through yeah. the door, right? Came through two doors and struck her oh to goodness. create the only civilian casualty. I know. Home. That's a shame. Yeah. Been there many times. Um, so, uh, some people explain being pulled or attracted to a certain location. I know you explained that you were a ranger. Uh, what initially drew you to Gettysburg in the first place? Uh, I think because we came here when I was a kid, you know, my parents brought me here okay. and, uh, for a vacation and, um, then we continued, they enjoyed it. They liked it because I grew up so- outside of Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Wasn't a lot of pretty, um, fields mm-hmm. or undulating, you know, or mountains or undulating fields or anything out there. So we started coming here fairly frequently, sometimes twice a year. 
Uh, I guess uh, in college, I got tired of uh, working construction for my dad, you know, and I said, mm-hmm. I'm going to try and get a job in Gettysburg. And, and I was lucky because I got the, the ranger position that was here. And, uh, and I'm, I don't know whether it's, um, you know, a past life mm-hmm. that I was you know, really um, drawn here. Um, it may have been more that I, you know, my imagination was stimulated by all the books I read when I was a kid. So. Right. right. But that, that's why, that's what got me here. Now, other people have other reasons, and it may very well be a past life, that they were here. I know a lot of reenactors feel that. Right. So, well, that's mysterious great. place. It's very, it is. It's right, and that's very possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, um, there's a lot of history here. And I know we talked about courts last time. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. Did you want to explain your theory on how quartz affects the haunting of Gettysburg? Well, I first heard this from a guy by the name of Joe Farrell, who thought <coughs> that maybe there was um, uh, some connection between the granite out on the park and, uh, you know, well, I don't everywhere in Gettysburg, and uh, the geology and um, the fact that the, uh, the the spirits may be captured by this. And at first, I thought that's kind of kind of a wild thought. But um, the more I thought about it, I was, you know, then we made the connection between electromagnetism and spirit energy, which we know we can pick up on EMF meters and various other devices. Then I thought, well, what does the quartz have to do with it? Is how, can, how can a rock be affected by electricity? This is pre-computer age. Right. But I was wearing a quartz watch. Okay. And yeah. I know that that quartz is vibrating 30,000 times a second with a little teeny tiny battery like that. Mm -hmm. So the wheel started turning a little bit. I said, maybe this does make sense. And you look at all the granite, and of course granite is filled with quartz. Right, okay. And um, this building, as a matter of fact, that we're in very typical of Gettysburg buildings, the foundation, if you go and look around, it's all those gray Mm -hmm. granite rocks filled with quartz. The local brick that was made here in Gettysburg, it's kind of a salmon color rather than the dark red. And that's all local. And that comes from the fields out here, filled with quartz. Mm-hmm. Um, is, there, is there something to the fact that, what, that when human beings die, they give off a burst of, of electromagnetism, of photons? This is actually true. Um, they have done, uh, in this old Soviet Union, they did experiments on it because we can't do that with dying people here. Right. But they did it there. And sure enough, there's a, uh, one fellow called it a light shout burst of photons, yeah. could this be embedded somehow in in the quartz, in the granite? And I'm thinking, well, now that we know that we have computers, this, virtually all of this um, stuff that we're broadcasting on is using uh, silicon, mm-hmm. you know, a chip, which is basically quartz. Right. So some of a gun, there might be something to this. You know, <laughs> we, might, we might be a giant recorder. Someone called it a stone recorder. Right. And that could be the, uh, at least could be the um, uh, explanation for residual haunting, mm. uh, where it's like a, a place over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the question is, okay, we know it happens spontaneously, that right. these things are reproduced, and we can see them or hear them or whatever. But is there um, some way where we can actually make it happen? Mm. Once we figure that out, then we may do be able to do a little more. Do you find that your batteries or laptops oh, yeah. die really quickly in this place? Uh, because not so much in, in it happened to me last night. Like oh, did I, it I was really? just walking around. My phone usually lasts. Uh, I mean, I can do a full battery uh-huh. all day, and this thing was dead by like. I mean, I had like five percent left right around, wow, wow. around seven thirty eight o'clock. And with, I mean, I looked at it, it said 5%. Mm-hmm. And within, I don't know what happened, within like 30 seconds, the whole thing just died. And that's, that's, that's with 5% left. I've never seen that before on my phone. <laughs> yeah. We attribute that to um, the fact that we think or theorize that uh, ghosts or spirits are energy thieves. Mm-hmm. They don't, have, I mean, they don't eat, you know, right. so they, it's mm-hmm. not like us where we get our energy. They may borrow or, or steal energy from us. I know after doing uh, an EVP session, I'm exhausted, mm-hmm. okay? And um, so I think that it's a possibility that maybe rather than the house draining your battery, you may run into one of the many ghosts that we have in here. Yeah, yeah. Could be. 
it was just like it was just walking around the place. Uh, it wasn't like any, any specific um, point of location or anything. It was just I think it's just this area, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, and I didn't even think about it initially. I was like, oh, how is my battery dead? And then I then I kind of remember it. I'm like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> well, that happens out on the battlefield like all the time. <laughs> yeah, like, more batteries right. die out there and then come back after I've gotten out of an area. Mm-hmm. Cameras will conk out. Then you get to another area and they're fine. So that is amazing. Yeah. yeah, there's something to it. I really, I really think there is. I, I get letters all the time. <laughs> now I've got a story our good friend David Walton recorded, and this is Fedori House, hmm. and this is from which book of yours, Mark? Uh, I think it's the first one. It's Ghost the first of Gettysburg. One. Yeah, Ghost of Gettysburg, number one, and we are playing this now, recorded by our good friend and British folk singer David Walton, and we're on Para X Radio. We're on EMC Podcast Network. We are on all podcast services live moving into YouTube as we get our videos sorted out. So this is Kadori House and we are in Gettysburg. Kadori House from Mark Nesbitt Ghost of Gettysburg Book One Read by David Walton The Kadori House at Gettysburg stood virtually in the middle of the site of some of the worst carnage in American history. In about 40 minutes of marching over the lush fields and fighting across the now famous stone wall, approximately two-thirds of the 12,000 Confederate soldiers who advanced in Pickett's charge fell as casualties, or were slain in the gently sloping fields within eyeshot of the Kadori farmhouse. It was, as records show, 40 of some of the bloodiest minutes in all of American history. One evening in the cooling fall of the year, the superintendent of the park and his wife left their home at the Kadori house for a social function in Gettysburg. The daughter of the superintendent was home alone. She was in the basement of the Kadori house, which had been remodelled as a recreation room, altered from its Civil War era use as a storage cellar for preserving foods canned by the Kadori family. It was getting late, and she was expecting her parents to arrive home any minute. Sure enough, she heard footsteps on the floor above her head. They travelled across the living room and into the dining room and back again. She thought it unusual that her father and mother would be in the house walking around for nearly a minute and not call to her. She walked to the stairs that led from the basement to the first floor and called out, Daddy? The only answer was the sound of footsteps crossing the room and beginning to ascend the stairs to the second floor. Daddy, she called again. With still no answer, she began to slowly climb the stairs from the basement to the phone located on the first floor. She could hear what she was convinced was an intruder walking through the bedrooms just above her head, apparently looking for something valuable. She quickly dialed the central number for the county's law enforcement dispatcher and requested that the park ranger on patrol hurry to the Kadori house on the Emmitsburg Road to check on a prowler in the house. She had barely gotten the information out when the footsteps crossed the second floor just above her head and began to approach the stairs and descend to the first floor. Hanging up the phone, she rushed into the basement again. Wanting to run, but not wanting to run into whomever it was who prowled above her head, she could only wait in icy apprehension for the patrol ranger. As she waited, The intruder stalked to the floor above her, apparently not interested in valuables, seeking something known only to him. His wanderings became more aimless, first to the kitchen, then back to the living room, then the dining room, pacing, 
pacing, to perhaps peer out of a window at the darkened fields where hopes for southern independence died forever. The ancient floorboards that once soaked up southern blood groaned with the wandering footfalls of an apparently lost intruder. Slowly, the footsteps approached the cellar steps. She swore she heard him put a foot on the top step. Annie! It was the voice of the chief ranger who had intercepted the call over his monitor and had come out personally to check on the superintendent's daughter and the prowler at his superior's home. As chief ranger, he had a master key to all the houses on the park. Bill, she said, as she started up the now empty cellar steps. Did you see him? He was right here. No, Anne. I didn't see anyone. But he was standing right here, she said, cautiously climbing the stairs the stranger had apparently just left. Maybe he ran out the back door or jumped out a window. Two other rangers came in from the yard, surrounding the house, where they had been sent by the chief ranger to catch anyone leaving the structure. Did you see him? she asked. He had to have gotten out somehow. Nothing was said. Nothing needed to be said. The expression on their faces told her that no one they could see had left the Kodori house that cool fall night.
And we are back in Gettysburg, episode 60, with ghost historian Mark Nesbitt. And we've jumped to record mode, because we've had some internet trouble, we're blaming it on the ghosts, <laughs> but I'm T. Fox on I'm back, Phil Thomas is here. I'm here, hello. Yeah, we're recording a video to put on YouTube, we are live in Ghosts of Gettysburg, Candlelight Tours, with Mark Nesbitt. How are you, Mark? Just fine, Fox. Yeah, we've been having some great conversation, which will be available on the longer audio version of the show. We had to shut that down because of some live concerns with the internet here, but we are going strong. I'm sure we'll be up on YouTube, and this will be available as a complete episode in our archives, also played over iHeartRadio and all the wonderful ones like iTunes and Google Play and EMC Podcast Network on Para-X next Friday as part of our countdown to Halloween. And we got a camera set up here as we're doing an experiment. You were just talking about a ghost. Well, yeah, I think I've solved your problem with the uh, why the internet and everything is electronic is getting is going a little slow. Um, we we have the camera placed right where uh, one of our famous ghosts stands at night, Hank. And uh, Hank is a uh, uh, apparently a soldier who was told to uh, guard the soldiers that were here to take care of them. And um, two of our employees literally ran into him one night. He seems to go on duty as the um, uh, lights go off. And um, they, um, in fact, there's one of them right now. Oh, a ghost just went by. <laughs> yes. And uh, sh uh, Katie, my manager, mm -hmm. was uh, shutting off all the lights. She came over to the carriage house where we stay. And she said, I just ran into somebody in the, in the, in the green room. Mm -hmm. and I said, um, should I call the police? She just, it's not going to help. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it was a ghost. And mm -hmm. he's big. I said, big. what are you big? Yeah, linebacker size, she said. And uh, another employee then ran into him uh, also. She's former military. And she said, when she came around the corner, um, he literally went on guard mm -hmm. with a rifle. And um, she said, um, yeah. It's, there's definitely definitely something over there, and he stands right where we put the camera. Right where the camera is, that's the spot, right? Yep. And do you know if, what kind of uh, soldier he is? Is he Confederate, Confederate is he soldier? Union? Confederate okay. soldier. Um, we've got through EVP, through pendulum work, through uh, dowsing rods and, and and mediums. They say that he is from Louisiana, hmm. although he may have been fighting with a uh, Georgia group. Okay. Hank is not his real name, but he doesn't like his real name. No, he doesn't like it. <laughs> How did you find that out? From through through uh, uh, pendulum work and, and yeah. the mediums and, and things like that. So, nice. so he doesn't make his own. So you yeah. use um, mediums who come in? Not the ones who come in. Ones that we've worked with for okay. a long time. Yeah, and uh, have. And, and you know, it's interesting because with Gettysburg, when a medium comes up with with something, a name, or a, a, a something odd, you can check it. I mean, you know, for example, one of our mediums, we were doing a um, uh, at the Hotel Gettysburg, and she came up with the name of a guy, um, and he. The, she said he actually is telling me he's wearing blue. I can see it. Okay. He actually told me he fought here at Gettysburg, but he's from Gettysburg. She says I don't understand that. Mm. I said, well, there was a unit that fought here at Gettysburg that was recruited in the Gettysburg area, and she came up with the name. Colbert's son, and she didn't know if it was Colbert's son or the name. Whole name was Colbertson, mm -hmm. and sure enough, on the uh, on the monument to the boys who fought at home, I went around the back and I'm going down and son of a gun if mm. it's not there. Really? So wow. Um, wow. Uh, you know, it, with with historic uh, places, you can check on your mediums. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty wow. cool. Wow, that's exciting. So, and, and just it's so great to be talking to you here, and we've got some wonderful ghost stories. Recorded from your books, Ghosts of Gettysburg. And I know, Phil, you've been a fan for a long time. Very long time. What happened in Gettysburg stayed in Gettysburg. <laughs> stayed in Gettysburg. Stay, not stays, stays. Stayed. stayed. Wonderful. Interesting play on words. I like that. That's pretty cool. I that's saw something like, yeah, I, I did see that. And I remember, I was like, well, that's pretty cool. We have it on our one of our um, I, <laughs> websites, I think. I like that. That's a play on yeah. words. Nice. But talking about some cool stuff that's coming up on the show, we have confirmed Lloyd Kaufman. Yes, creator, creator and producer and director at Trauma Entertainment. Yes, yes he is. And our fans may know them from movies like The Toxic Avenger, 
Old Toxie and Duke yeah. Nukem High. He's like the B movie guy. That's a Nukem High. That's right. Yeah, B movie guy. <laughs> and I worked with him before. You did. He was yeah. one of your films. He was in one of my movies. Yeah. So he will be coming on the show in October. And I just spoke to Katrina Weidman last night. And she's you know, remember Philadelphia. She's always on Discovery Channel, and she wants to finalize the interview for October. That's, that's so be she'll great. be coming on as part of our countdown to Halloween. And we got Mr. Mark Nesbitt here, and we were at Fort Mifflin last week, which was a great show with Darcy York, Philadelphia ghost historian. You know, she came on and she, and she was wonderful. So, Mark, would you consider yourself a paranormal investigator or a paranormal journalist, a paranormal author, a reporter? What are you in the paranormal field? Well, it's kind of changed a little bit since I got started. I was a historian collecting folklore um, and and just making sure it got got in print. Um, but about Ghost, Ghost of Gettysburg 4... It's when I started doing paranormal investigations, and that's when it it, uh, it changed a little bit. And you can actually see it in my books. I started having more personal experiences, or at least paying attention to the experiences, and realizing that they actually were paranormal. And now it's at a point where um, it's gets uh, it's getting kind of scientific in a way, you know, um, trying trying to get my hands on exactly what. Um, it is, and how it can be, how it can be scientifically proven. Because I really do think that there 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 is something to uh, this, other than just you know uh, running around in a dark house with some meters <laughs> and trying to scare yourself. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, um, and the key, of course, to all this is is is, is attempting to um, refine the communication mm-hmm. between this side and, and the next, and that's that's the real challenge, I think, is so that we can start to get more information you've been you've been doing this a long time what would you say is your most uh, memorable or impactful experience oh wow wow there's been a lot um i think maybe um the lady farm Mm -hmm. which we have photographs of i don't know if i mentioned to that that to you on the last uh, broadcast we did together but it's uh, it's about three or four minutes long. Do you have time? Sure. For that? Well, you know, let me pause there, okay. and we can come back to this one. I love this story. It's one of my absolute favorites. But we've got some wonderful music to play on this episode, episode sixty. Tom Capper's just arrived. Sounds like he's had one heck of a night. And we are here in Gettysburg as part of our recorded episode, episode sixty, on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show on Parax Radio, EMC Podcast Networks, all major podcast services, and you can find us at www. What are you afraid of? Podcast dot com. <laughs> what happens to a ghost when their home is torn down? No one thinks of the disembodied when they rip down old buildings, dig up cemeteries, and build clean, unhauntable condos. Every year, hundreds of spirits are driven out of their own haunts by the careless living to exist alone with no one to scare. At Para-X Radio, our hosts feel the plight of these evicted disembodied and we're reaching out to you to please open your heart to one of these lost souls, such as the ghost soldier of the General Wayne Inn or the abandoned spirit cat of Benjamin Rush. So please, please let a little spooky into your life. Won't you open your house to a ghost without a home? Para X. And we are back in Gettysburg at Ghosts of Gettysburg Candlelight Tours. The best, I'm sorry, it is the best ghost tour, the most original, the most researched in Gettysburg. And there's quite an industry here for, for ghost tours. If you look around and remind people, we are recording live on site. But we've got a great little video which you'll be able to find on our website and up on our YouTube channel. We're here with Mark Nesbitt. It's Halloween time, finally. Second day of autumn. Halloween is coming up, Halloween 2017, and we've got a great amount of countdown content coming on the show. So, Mark, we've talked a little bit about EVPs. Right. And do you want to tell our audience what EVPs are? Well, EVPs are, uh, it's, it stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. And uh, it has quite a history going back really to the uh, invention of magnetic tape is when, and some say even back farther than that, to uh, um, Edison um, when he was recording apparently uh, on wire. But EVPs are voices 
that are recorded when they can't be heard. Uh, in other words, electronically. Um, and we in Gettysburg um, have, uh, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, we have quite a, uh, a reputation for getting um, EVPs at specific places. I like to do it on battlefields because, once again, you have uh, automatically a someone to talk to. All you have to do is look on the monuments and you get a name of someone who was killed or wounded, and you can um, try and address that individual. Uh, it's a little difficult, a little more difficult sometimes because when you are trying to get EVP, a lot of times you'll hear a lot of people talking in the background. It's almost like white noise, like you're in a in a party and you can hear what everybody's that everybody's talking, but you can't hear what they're saying. With the uh, military aspect of it, all you need to do really, for the most part, is just ask for the highest ranking officer. Mm, so we always do, and you know that almost any soldier is going to say, "Okay, guys." Pipe down, <laughs> let the lieutenant talk. Right. So, and I've gotten quite a few. Andrew, what state are you from? So tell us about that one. Okay, that one was recorded in the basement of the Cash Town Inn, which is about seven miles to the west. Cash Town Inn was very famous because uh, probably... Three quarters of the army came through Cash Town. The Confederate army came through Cash Town on the way to Gettysburg. Mm. I was there with a, a medium, and she said, "I think we have somebody from the Confederacy here, uh, rebel." And um, he, his name is Andrew. And I said, "Okay, let me see if I can find out where he's from." So I asked Andrew, "What state are you from?" And you might be able to hear four distinct syllables. And I won't tell you right now, but after you play it again, I'll tell you what I think he says. Oh yeah, I'll try. Playing it again. Okay. okay, and this is from the Cash Town Inn. Correct. Andrew, what state are you from? Yeah, so you can hear him kind of staticky, but you can hear him speaking. Right, and there's there are four uh, syllables, and I hear Mississippi. Incredible. So he was from Mississippi. Mississippi. Wow. Oh. So you have some more here. Yeah, the next one was actually recorded two two o six. Yeah, the next one was recorded in this building. This is Kip Miller. I understand you didn't like our little tiny cookies the other night. You don't like those? I understand you'd like some larger cookies and some teacups that are not chipped. If we get you those, what are you going to do with the teacups? This is Kip Miller. What kind of tea do you like? So, what was, what were they saying there? All right, that was Mrs. Kitzmiller. Mrs. Kitzmiller owned this house longer than anyone uh, from uh, 1866 to 1914. Mm -hmm. Every time we brought a group in, she would uh, communicate to us and say, you need, you need tea and cookies for your guests. Okay. Because she was a Victorian mm. lady, and that's what they offered. And I couldn't explain to her that we can't do that because we don't serve food here. Mm. We found some cookies, yeah. just old <laughs> stale cookies yeah. up in the up in the closet. And so I put them out, and I asked her, and you can hear me say, Mrs. Kiss Miller, how do you like the cookies I put out? And um, you can hear her say, I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, she can't eat them, right? <laughs> no, she can't. That's a, mm -hmm. Yeah. Although that's that's just in, incredible. Yeah. So I'll play that again okay. for our for our audience so you can hear how much she hates them. This is Kitz Miller. I understand you didn't like our little tiny cookies the other night. You don't like those? I understand you'd like some larger cookies and some teacups that are not chipped. If we get you those, what are you going to do with the teacups? This is Kitz Miller. What kind of tea do you like? So, yeah, so she does not like cookies. No. And as we've discussed, not the ones we gave her. No, no yeah. right. I, probably not the right cookies. Well, when you're Victorian and you're dead, I, I think you're going to want better cookies. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. This one was taken. There's a place called Iverson's Pits out at um, the first day's battlefield. It was a scene of a of basically a slaughter for some more, of some North Carolinians. Okay. They buried them in a long trench. They exhumed the bodies, and it left a pit. And they called it Iverson's Pits. And none of the forkers would mm. work out there. They kept hearing things like bullets thudding into flesh, mm. men shouting orders, and screams. So we can go ahead and play that 
creepy. Yeah, um, well, I did not. I did not um, take this one. I did not collect it. It was collected by Patty Wilson's uh, group. Don't know if I want to take this one. You know what you're talking about. Okay, let's give it a go. Um, do That's terrifying. Yes, it is. As a matter wow. of fact, it's really it's really pretty stark. And that was done on a reel to reel cassette. Mm -hmm. um, so. And who recorded this? I'm sorry. Um, a woman with Patty Wilson's group. Uh, she is uh, one of my co-authors. She is a paranormal investigator. Where's she out of? Bedford, Pennsylvania. Bedford, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's play this again. <laughs> Oh, wow. That was chilling, wasn't it, Phil? Yeah. That, that's what that's, you got. Incredible. That's creepy. Yeah. And then we have uh, one or two that are um, absolutely Class A, and uh, you'll hear a Class A EVP. Once again, Patty Wilson recorded, recorded this, this one. one at a, a, a massacre site from the uh, in Pennsylvania from the Revolutionary War. What I've been trying to tell you all night is my name's Patty, and I was trying to ask your name, Omani Tatanka. Now, oh, that's great. The term Yankees is, from my understanding, yeah, 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 kind of a um, bastardization of um, of Anglais mm -hmm. that the Native Americans, when they, when they tried to pronounce it, got because, you know, the three basic... You know, English, uh, Shawnee, and uh, uh, French. And so um, you had, that, that was their um, bastardization of, 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 of English. And there's one more that's even more frightening if you want to play it again, once again, at this at this massacre site. We're going to play that EVP collected now. Remember, they're out there with these recorders. They're asking the silence. Speak to them. The dead to have a voice. And this is what they're finding. And it's terrifying to me because most of these things sound like they're in some kind of pain or desperate to be heard. Dead. Hello? Comment uh, Palou, what does that mean? I don't speak French very well. And that's interesting because it was in French. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've heard of that. They, they, like at Fort Mifflin, when they were asking for EVPs, there were, of course, English, French. They were speaking in French. They were speaking in German. Because not, a, not every ghost speaks English, obviously. And that, that leads to a good question. Are these ghosts retaining their personalities from life that they lived? Or is it some sort of imprint or echo? Mm. you know, of their former lives, like some sort of, we're talking about the idea of courts recording the contents of people's minds or their souls, and are we actually hearing sentient beings, or are we just hearing the fading echo in a canyon wall, bouncing back and forth, getting quieter and quieter, you know, why aren't we hearing ghosts that go back 2,000 years or 15,000 years, wherever people have lived and died, why have they... We've been only hearing ghosts that have been more recently speaking English. And I wonder, is it because they're fading? I was at Union Mills mm -hmm. in Maryland, where Jeb Stewart and the cavalry came through, spent the night. And I didn't want to talk, even though I wrote a book about him, I didn't feel comfortable talking to the great general. So I tried to get in touch with one of his, um, his aides, Major Andrew Reed Venable. And I asked him... Um, did you write in with General Stewart? And immediately you'll hear the EVP right after that. Then I'll ask him who was president, and, and I'll let you try and figure that out. Major General, did you write in with General Stewart? Major General, who's president? Now, as soon as I say, Major Venable, did you write in with General Stewart, you hear, hear a voice say, I did. Mm -hmm. And then, after that, when I ask who's president, probably a lot of people were thinking, oh, he's going to say Abraham Lincoln. But if you listen to him real closely, you'll hear, he kind of stutters a little bit, mm -hmm. Je Je Jefferson, 
Davis. Jefferson Davis. That was his president. Who, of course, was president of the Confederacy. Sure. The sure, the Confederacy during the American Civil War. Sure. And do you have any others here? Uh, there's one more. Uh, it's called Fall Hill. Now, Fall Hill was down in Virginia. We did many paranormal investigations down there. Fall Hill goes back to the Native American days. Um, I was interviewing the owner of this this 18th century home, and she was talking about um, what they what they planned to do and how dedicated they were to the place. And I wasn't even addressing the ghost, and someone overlaid someone just butted in and you can hear a, a voice um uh, say something and i will explain it after we play it right so we made a wish list and honestly when we drove down the driveway nine years ago the, the hairs on the back of my neck the hairs on the back of my neck yeah, when I I didn't realize that I'd recorded that until I was trying to transcribe the uh, the history of the house. The woman was uh, uh, explaining it to me, and then and the recorder was sitting right in between us on her on on, on the um, uh, on the couch. Mm -hmm. And when I played it back, I heard the voice say, "Hear me out." And uh, I don't know where it came from because I was uh, her son was the only other guy in the room. It's obviously a man's voice. He was all the way across the room, and he didn't—he wasn't saying anything. I was asking him questions and everything. So, and it obviously has an otherworldly quality to it. You know, it's obviously not someone right there, but that just goes to show you that you really don't have to be addressing a particular spirit or a ghost to um, to to get to, for them to talk to you. Well, incredible. So let me let me play that one more time for our listeners. This is your EVPs recorded by. Paranormal adventurer and Gettysburg ghost historian Mark Nesbitt. All right. So we made a wish list, and honestly, when we drove down the driveway nine years ago, the, the hairs on the back of my neck. We've got a great ghost story written about the Civil War, the American Civil War. It's very important to point out the last Civil Wars from. Horror author James Chambers. He's chairman of the HWA membership committee. We just saw him in Fort Mifflin. He read from some wonderful books of his. I mean, he's done some stuff with the Kojak series. And he's written us a special short story called Out of Devil's Den on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. We'll be right back. But this is What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. Recording in Gettysburg on video for the first time going up on YouTube and on Para-X Radio and the EMC Podcast Network. And I'm T. Fox Dunham. We're here with Mark Nesbitt, and this is James Chambers, Out of Devil's Den. Out of Devil's Den by James Chambers. Dr. Spencer, how an educated man such as yourself can credit such a tale, I will not understand. Sergeant Thomas McNamara swiped from the whiskey bottle on the table between us, then slammed it down and groaned. And what tale might that be? said Major Josephus Crane. He brushed in through the tent flaps, bringing along a breath of fresh air into the cloud of the day's gathered room of stale blood and rotten flesh. The moans of the wounded serenade us from the adjoining tent. The world itself sagged in fatigue under the horrors of Gettysburg, the bloodiest battle yet to preserve the Union, and the weight of that world hung squarely atop the Major's shoulders. He regarded us both with weary curiosity. Taking no time to wash during my brief respite from sawing bones and sewing bullet holes, I must have looked a bloody nightmare. A child's tale, that's what it is, said McNamara. A battlefield anecdote, one of the prisoners told me, I said. Helping himself to a slug from our bottle, Crane settled himself atop a supply crate. Why don't you share it, Dr. Spencer? I might benefit from a moment's distraction, he said. Ah, it's a waste of breath and time, McNamara said. There's not much to share, I said. One of the prisoners, a boy, barely old enough to shave, told me the thing while I tended to wounds in his chest and neck. Seems he led out from his family's farm south of Charleston to join the Confederate Army, lied about his age to enlist. A cousin caught wind of his mischief and pulled strings to have him assigned to his regiment. The boy of a name, Crane said. Clayton Morris, or simply Clay as he told me. His cousin? Ronald. 
familiarly known as Ronnie. Also prisoner? If he is, sir, his prison is either divine or infernal, depending on how he lived. Ronnie did not see today's sunsets thanks to the acumen of artillery men at Little Round Top. Crane nodded, drank again from my bottle, then frowned. Gentlemen, I apologize. I seem to have depleted your whiskey. He reached inside his coat and produced a silver flask, which he offered to McNamara. I pray this brandy might make up my lack of courtesy. McNamara drank from the flask and passed it to me. I gulped Crane's fine brandy with relish, its rich heat cutting through the very tang of blood persistent in my throat. When I thumped it down on the table, Crane gestured for me to continue. Being less than full-grown, young Clay proved a hard study when it came to combat skills. Again, Cousin Ronnie intervened and arranged for his kin to keep close to him and assist him in executing a skill for which he earned some measure of renown amongst his compatriots. That being the targeting of Union soldiers from a great distance and with a high degree of accuracy. He was a sharpshooter, Crane said. Indeed, one nested at the Devil's Den, responsible for no less than a dozen casualties to our forces. McNamara grunted. They say a serpent lives in those rocks, maybe fifteen feet long, a bit of the devil himself dropped in the soil to grow in the stone shadows. Major Crane and I regarded the sergeant with raised eyebrows. Ha! Huh, didn't say I believed that. McNamara imbibed the major's flask, then wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. And I didn't say I was going to sit through another telling of his fairy tale. He lurched upright and stamped out of the tent. I resumed the story. Clay's job, while Cousin Ronnie shot, was to keep watch, help him sight, and handle his ammunition. The lay of the land up at the Devil's Den allowed for him to take cover twenty yards away from a boulder when he wasn't running fresh loads of water or rations to Ronnie. Our cannon on Little Round Top targeted the den, of course, and they landed around directly inside the rocky cop that provided the best vantage point. I sighed, nipped a bit more brandy, and then closed my eyes. Imagine for a moment the effect of a cannon shell contained within a limited ring of solid, immovable stone. The explosion itself, the shrapnel, but most of all, all the application of the concussion as it reverberated off stone and earth, filling the air itself with deadly force. I have seen the results of such a ferocious discharge of energy. To the naked eye, the dead appear quite peaceful, unharmed, as if they simply nodded off and slumped to the ground. The state of their internal organs remains unseen, those having turned to jelly, their bones to powder, and their muscles to pulp all within their skin. It is a terrifying, yet mercifully quick way to die. Hunkered down, shielded by one of the largest, thickest stones in Devil's Den, Clay avoided that deadly outcome. When the din faded, he raced back to the sniper's nest, where he found all but his cousin Ronnie quite dead. Ronnie himself shrieked like a madman, firing wildly across the valley. He rushed fresh loads to his kinsmen. His heart, he told me, lodged itself in his throat. He damned near soiled himself from the shock. He had never witnessed such raw, animalistic fury as he discerned in Ronnie's expression. But he kept his head and did his job. He owed his cousin that much. When a law came in the firing, a hand dropped onto Clay's shoulder. Nearly leaping out of his skin, Clay wheeled around and saw, well, he claims he saw a face both familiar and explicable, that of his cousin Ronnie. Clay studied the lone sharpshooter, still screaming and shooting. Then he regarded his cousin standing beside him, the same man in two places at once. One's face twisted with unfettered rage that shook Clay to his core. The others bowed with such sadness and despair. Clay felt himself on the verge of tears merely looking at it. We ought not to be fighting this war, Cousin Ronnie told young Clay. I see that now. We ought to lay down our arms and go home to our families. You hear me, Clay? Before Clay could answer, the double of his cousin expended his ammunition, then turned on him in a violent fury, striking him with the butt of his iron field, and then casting the rifle aside to seize him by his jacket and thrash him. Next he drew a knife and wielded its blade, poised it to slice young Clay apart. A miracle saved him. In the moment before his maddened cousin could strike, a sad-faced Ronnie stepped into his frenzied counterpart. Clay described it as seeing double, then everything coming into focus as one, united. Now Ronnie released him, and with Clay's next breath, he crumpled dead to the earth. It was, Clay told me, 
as if the cannon strike had knocked the soul from his cousin and left his animalistic corpse unaware it had died until they rejoined. Quiet followed my telling of the tale, and we each drank more brandy. It is not the strangest tale I have heard since this war began, but it is perhaps the most affecting, said Crane. The tent flaps rustled, startling us. Clayton Morris appeared in the opening. I heard you talking about my cousin, Doc. He was right, you know. I know that now. I see what he saw. All you Union boys, you stand firm on your convictions. Don't give up. Major Crane jolted to his feet and reached for his revolver. I raised my hand to steady him. You ought not to be here, Mr. Morris. How did you escape the pen? I said. Clayton shrugged. For the span of three heartbeats, he gazed at me with such intense longing, mingled with despair, and a third emotion I can only describe as utter amazement of the kind one feels upon finding the long-sought solution to a difficult problem that has been right in front of your eyes the whole time. Then he turned and left the tent. Moments later, Sergeant McNamara rejoined us. I bring some news of interest, he said. Mr. Clayton Morris, your young confederate succumbed to his injuries several hours ago. The name of his dead cousin, Ronnie, lay on his lips. The truth of whatever story he spun for you died with him. Major Crane and I exchanged stunned glasses. The Major tipped his brandy flask once again to his lips, and as he handed it to me, I met McNamara's stare and said, Sometimes, Sergeant, it's simply not possible to obtain the truth from the living. Well, 
So that was James Chambers writing a wonderful story for the show. Thank you, James, so much. You were wonderful at our reading in Fort Mifflin. We really appreciate all the support you've given us. And he is chairman of the membership committee of the Horror Writers Association, of course, of course, which I'm a member of, and I know Phil's planning to join. Mm-hmm. You know, when when your book comes out, your next book, your first book, which book is that again, Phil? Uh, it's The Pope Predicament. And who's putting that out? <laughs> That's Caliber and Press, right? Caliber, yeah, uh, pretty, um, published by Caliber and Press. Will and be published by Caliber. You're working on a second book. Yeah, worst afterlife ever. Worst after- I'm sorry, <laughs> I have to keep doing that from the synopsis. It, it just gets me. Caliber and Press LLC is a Madison, Wisconsin based publishing company owned and operated by Alan Ledden. Caliber and works with talented writers, artists, editors, and marketers throughout the United States, and you can find their books through their many imprints that include Damnation Books, Eternal Press, Malafuria Press, Ciento Sordida Publishing, and Spiro Publishing. Please visit their website at sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash Caliburn Press LLC forward slash home or Google Caliburn Press to check out their growing list of titles on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and any other place fine books are sold. What are you afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show. Sometimes we're live, sometimes we're recorded. You can never tell. We could be recording from your closet or your basement right now. We do that. We break into people's houses, go into their basement, and record our show because my in-laws just won't let us record there. You might want to check your basement. You might check check your basement right now, but we'll tell you. It's a ghost. It's an absolute ghost. And right now we've broken into Ghosts of Gettysburg Candlelight Tours in Gettysburg. We've taken Mark Nesbitt Mr. Ghost of Gettysburg, I keep calling him, the top ghost historian, one of the top in the country. You can see him on History Channel and Discovery Channel on, on a lot of different channels, right? I mean, you, you are the go-to guy for Ghosts of Gettysburg, and he's brought us this wonderful town. My wife and I are looking forward to a lovely weekend together, um, you know, in Gettysburg. I'm What Are You Afraid of Harn Paranormal Show, Episode 60. Gremlins of Gettysburg. No, no, it's Ghost. <laughs> Gettysburg Ghosts. That's part, another show. Yeah, it's another show. <laughs> part of our countdown to Halloween 2017, and we've got some amazing stuff. It's a recap. Uh, Mr. Lloyd Kaufman, uh, Trauma Entertainment, is coming on the show. And I just spoke to Katrina Weidman. She'd like to be on in October, so we're going to get her on. And we'll be down at Penhurst Asylum, Haunted Penhurst, doing live shows, fingers crossed, Hmm. Which I Hopefully over. live, yeah. yeah. We'll be recording down there with video and audio um, a couple of times in October. We'll have some special guests on. And we'll be talking about the history of that wonderful haunted asylum. We're so happy to be going down. So, continuing our interview with Mark Nesbitt. So, yeah, uh, Mark, um, you've been doing this a very long time. I was just wondering what would you say is your most memorable or impactful paranormal experience over the years? Well, I would have to say an experience I had at uh, the Daniel Lady Farm uh, was probably the most impactful because I still can't figure it out. I mean, it, it is complete, it's a complete mystery to me. But um, the, the Daniel Lady Farm was a uh, Confederate hospital. The front room was the, was the surgery room, the operating room. And um, it had been bought, it had been purchased, the whole farm, by a not local nonprofit organization mm-hmm. and restored. Um, but the only thing that they couldn't restore were the blood stains in the operating room that are there to this day uh, mm-hmm. on the wooden floor. Really? In fact, there's even one that is in the shape of a, of a handprint really? where a fella, they call him up to be operated on, he put his hands down and he picked it up and it's, and, and it's in the shape of, uh, of his hand, the blood oh, stains. Wow. So at any rate, I got a phone call from the caretaker out there and he said, Mark, if you want to have a paranormal experience happening right before your eyes come on out here. Yeah. Who can pass that up, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, um, I jumped in the van, threw all my gear in the van, and I, and I got out. And I was, I was recording when I got out. And so I got to the door, and he said, come on in. I don't know what's going to happen. Something's going to fly out at me or what. Right. And he took me into this room as he explained. You know, we had all this cleaned up because we had a Confederate group touring the place yesterday. And we had all this cleaned up. But... Here's what we found this morning. And as I walked in, on the floor were st- st- 
streams of a rust colored liquid. Mm. There was like a clear serum separating from it, and there were spots around of this, drops around of this liquid, and they were starting to crystallize. And I have a couple of photographs yeah. here. Let's take a and look. Um, this is one of them right there. Mm. Wow. I have a yardstick there. You can see that that uh, tells you how big they were. Here's another one from a different angle. So I'm wow. looking at these things and I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm like, I wonder if anything, um, yeah, I said, did a pipe break downstairs? And he says, nope. Oh. So, and there's nothing on the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. And so I photographed them and I said, my work here is done. I don't know what else to do. I said, but I said, do you, he said, I don't know what, what to do with these things. He says, I, I got to go out and work on the fields because he was the caretaker of the farm too. Mm. I said, do you have a tissue? And he said, yeah. So I got a tissue and I dipped it in this liquid okay. and I put it in my car and I left. Mm -hmm. About two or three hours later, I got a phone call mm -hmm. from the guy and he said, They're, it's gone. Really? Mm -hmm. I said, gone? What do you mean it's gone? He says, it's disappeared. I said, I'll be right out. Mm -hmm. Out I go. I walk into the room with my video camera going and he walks in with me and we're looking at the floor. Mm -hmm. And he bends down. He says, it was right here, wasn't it? I said, yeah. He goes, what the heck? And he puts up his hand. You can see it on the video. His hand has a little, uh, a little layer of dust. Oh. Right there where that, where that was. He said, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. I said, and Carol was with me, and she said, I wonder if the samples that you took out of here are intact. So she ran out to the car, and she said, yeah, they're still there. Well, the organization is pretty well connected in Pennsylvania, and they had some um, um, relations with a uh, forensics mm. laboratory. So they sent the sample to the forensics lab. About three weeks later, the report came back, and this substance, this liquid, is blood. Really? And the species mm. is human. Ah, oh, that's the question wow. my doctor had. So all that is yeah. human blood. I was... I was seeing my doctor just last week, I've seen a lot of doctors last few weeks. I just saw my one of my doctors recently and I told him we were doing this and he was fascinated immediately and he wanted to know what was my favorite of your ghost stories. And I said it has to be the lady farm. Mm -hmm. And he went and I told him the whole story and he said, Well do they know what kind of blood it was? And I didn't remember if they did or not. And you just answered it. It was human blood. Human yeah. blood. And the interesting thing is, you know, people can say, well, you know, because he told me, the caretaker told me he had just uh, just came in and he saw this. They said, well, he could have cleaned it up. Well, problem is there was dust on it. Mm. And yeah. the second problem is I can we can go into that room and I can show you blood stains that are 150 years old. Wow. Because the, it just doesn't come out. Jeez. Okay. So that doesn't make sense. It's like I was in a time warp. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, stuff happened backwards, and it's all it's all documented. So, at any rate, that if if anything is the most impactful, that certainly is just by the fact that it's I, I can't explain it. I, yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with that one. Yeah, that's, that's something something big. Big. I mean, I've heard of ectoplasm yeah. materializing, right, course, right, but but never blood, and I just wonder if that's a testament to the tragedy here, yeah. and so many so many lost lives in the yeah. Battle of Gettysburg, and this is something. That we've been talking about. Like Darcy Orth brought this up, and that's what makes a haunted site a haunted site. What what element in the nature of life, of reality, affects time and space so badly that time bleeds through, as you're saying, bleed through. I mean, if it's tragedy, and most people need to create logic <coughs> to explain these paranormal ones, they're just trying to understand it. Once they understand it, they won't be afraid of it. And the question is, if tragedy seems to be, and you, you watch a haunting, you watch all the ghost shows, and everybody always explains, there was a murder in the house, or somebody hurt children in the house. It's usually some psychic who comes up and talks about terrible things being done in the house, which is kind of par for the course. In any house, there's always something, there was a man who had an alcoholic problem, or there was a, a child who had a seizure, and they kept him up in the attic, and it's like, and that's the nature of the hauntings. It's, so why isn't, um, you know, the World Trade Center site, why isn't that a massive site haunted? Or why aren't the concentration camps in Poland, why aren't these places teeming with anguished spirits, calling out their pain to voices, you know, two ears that can never hear them? And I just wanted to hear your take on that. Well, I do have stories from both. 
Oh, do you? Oh, oh yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah, hmm. I have stories from the from the Twin Towers and I, from uh, uh, Flight 93. As a matter of fact, Patty Wilson, my co-author, mm-hmm. uh, actually wrote, uh, interviewed one of the night watchmen out there that who was out there when it was nothing but a... Uh, uh, not a shed, but a, but a, a trailer, mm-hmm. and um, they all heard footsteps come up the trailer steps, and uh, the, the somebody knock on the door, and they'd open the door, and nobody was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, one fella saw um, a person in a uh, in a uh, stewardess uniform mm-hmm. uh, one night while he was out there, and. Um, at any rate, yeah, that and I've got gotten stories from from uh, the Twin Towers, and uh, you know, so it's it's a it's a uh, an interesting thing that that no doubt human emotion mm-hmm. is much much more powerful than um, than we have given it credit for. I mean, it is a force in itself, uh, and but we just don't you know we don't know how to measure it, mm-hmm. and that's the problem. But it apparently embeds itself. When a man is dying, and when he knows he's not going to see his family, he's worried about his family. What's his wife going to do without him? What's going to happen to him in the next five minutes when he dies? Um, that's pretty emotional, yeah. and that that definitely puts a puts a whirl in the in the uh, in the in the stream of time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And if it if if that's the way we look at it, then maybe it does play itself back again, like the like the stream does when it goes around a rock so i don't know it's it's um, very interesting and, and that's why i continue to study it because i you know i can't help myself i, I want to know what's going on right. incredible yeah right. you're you're out seeking mm-hmm. answers and it sounds like you've got a pretty good idea that something continues i have no doubt i've said this from the beginning that that death is is not a closing door it's an opening door Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's whatever lays beyond, right? Yeah, Correct. Lays yeah. So I, I purchased uh, your first two volumes of Ghosts in Gettysburg, Red and the Blue, mm-hmm. as a teenager way back in 96, and uh, when I was here with my dad. And I pretty much give them full credit in sparking my interest in the supernatural. That's, so, that's good to hear. I'd like to thank you for that. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And um, did you ever think that these books would have such a huge impact on as many people as they have over the years? What makes them so exceptional? Oh wow! I don't know. I you know I I I, I think it's tackling a uh, a subject that we all really really want to know about. Right. I mean you know it's I often say that you know we should spend millions and billions of dollars trying to get to another planet. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we're never going to go. I'm not right, you are. Right. We none of us. Nobody right. we even know is going to go. Right. <laughs> um, but we virtually spend nothing on on. Um, after life studies, and yeah. guess what? We're all going there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. no, no choice. We, we all are going. There's that's and, a guarantee. And so it's being done on a, on a level like you guys are doing, mm-hmm. and like I'm doing. You know, basically. Um, so I think what people are are maybe the maybe the books gave them a little bit of um, more to think about. Mm. You know, and 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 dis- and they've discovered. I think as I have that Gettysburg is kind of like a giant laboratory. Right, right. If you want to experiment uh, in what's going on in the afterlife, you can come to Gettysburg. It's, to got, it's got the tools. Yeah. It's got the tools are here. It's got it. It's got it all here. It's right. like the perfect storm right. for uh, 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 spirits to be. And I think one of the uh, one of the big reasons also is, um, I mean, you were, I mean, you were almost a, pretty much a pioneer doing this. This is nineties, you know, right? And not a lot of people were doing it. There were a lot of people that had. You know, it kind of goes in and out of favor. Uh, a lot of people doing it in the eighteen hundred or not, yeah, eighteen hundreds when, uh, you know, they had the uh, Society for Psychical Research over in, in Great Britain. Then it kind of died out. It seems like every time a uh, a charlatan mm. is is proven, right. then it kind of dies. Then then of course you had the Ryan Institute, mm. and you had Stanford that had their uh, studies, uh, and then that kind of died out. And then uh, I don't know if I rekindled the interest but mm-hmm. it certainly um uh it, now it's now you have uh, programs on tv you know yeah. for the for the for better or for worse mm-hmm. that are uh involving that and giving it more of an audience mm-hmm. so i don't know maybe there's a hopefully hopefully we don't find any charlatans which i'm sure <laughs> we will and that will then throw cold water on it again because right. we're 
you know, we've got a good start on these things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, it's easier for Phil and I because we don't really do any ghost hunts ourselves anymore. We're just right. paraturnalists, mm-hmm. you know. But we've got a ghost story from your second Ghost of Gettysburg book, Seminary Ridge, read by Michael Garrett on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show, episode 60, extra long episode, because Mark Nesbitt deserves it. He's an incredible mind sharing with us his explorations in the paranormal community and basically opening our consciousness to a whole new world. And we are on Parax Radio on Friday nights, sometimes doing live specials. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work out, but it, it's going pretty well. We're working with the video now, which you'll be able to see of Mark Ness. It's been a great interview coming out for Halloween 2017. We're on the EMC Podcast Network, and you'll find us on all major podcast services. And check out the new website at www. What are you afraid of? podcast.com. We're having a great time out here in Gettysburg. Seminary Ridge, researched and written by Mark Nesbitt. In April 1992, a student at the seminary who had read Ghosts of Gettysburg called and asked if I was interested in something that had happened to him and a friend just the month before. He told me of how one night in the first week of March he had fallen asleep in his dormitory room in one of the newer buildings which sits on the west slope of Seminary Ridge, just a few hundred yards or so from where the Union Army struggled on the first day of Gettysburg, and John Fulton Reynolds spent his last moments on Earth. About 2 a.m. he was awakened by a scream from down the hall. He recognized the voice as one of his friends, assumed that he was kidding around with someone in the dorm, and fell back asleep. Then, at about 3 a.m., he was awakened by a cold chill. Thinking he had left a window open and that the wind had changed direction, he opened his eyes. Standing against one wall of the room, leaning against his dresser, was a man dressed in dark blue with a dark beard. At first, assuming he was dreaming, he closed his eyes tightly and opened them again. The man still stood there, completely visible, but only from the waist up. Fighting the growing panic, still hoping he was dreaming, again he closed his eyes and opened them, and still the man stood watching him. A third and final time, to assure himself that he wasn't dreaming and perhaps to gather courage. He closed his eyes, opened them, and still the man stood, staring. The seminarian sat up in bed to confront the dark, bearded intruder, and the man vanished. Sleep came with great difficulty the rest of that night. A day or so later, he ran into his friend, whom he had heard kidding around in the middle of the night, and asked what tomfoolery he had been engaged in to cause such a wild screech. The friend proceeded to tell him that, at about 2 a.m., he had awakened to see a frightening and unexplainable intruder in his dormitory room. A man, darkly countenanced, had visited him through his locked door as he awakened, piercing eyes staring at him over a heavy, shadowed beard. What frightened him most is that no body accompanied the visage, just that veiled, disembodied face and head floating surreally before him. While the head was completely discernible and distinct, the body just couldn't materialize itself. The scream his friend heard down the hall was certainly not one of joviality, but of horror and fear. Perhaps the most frightening thing about the story is that the dark, bearded man was alone, without a beautiful, charming young woman at his side. A lost soul on his way to fulfill the sincere nuptial promises made earlier, now stuck meandering somewhere between Gettysburg, Lancaster, and Emmitsburg. Was it perhaps for her that he was searching? With so many souls set free on their fantastic journey within sight of the seminary, who's to say for sure who might still be wandering, seeking, searching for whatever? 
but obviously not finished with his nocturnal search. The dark-visaged apparition in indigo blue moved down the hall an hour later to seek further and pay yet another visit upon an unsuspecting student. That was a wonderful story, read by Michael Garrett, and we're sitting down with Tom Capper, who is a reenactor here. He's a bit of a ghost hunter himself. He turned into a clown on one of our previous episodes, <laughs> but he's back now. Oh, uh, thanks for breaking me out of that truck, by the way. Oh, that, that was no problem, because I knew you were in there, I just wasn't coming in for ice cream, because I, I was definitely rescuing my buddies, <laughs> you know, it wasn't... The, the Nutty Buddy bar that I was after. By the way, you ate all of them. Yeah, it's well, you get hungry when you're stuck in the truck, you know. Mm-hmm. So we got, so you've been recording some EVPs down here in Gettysburg. And yes. We've got two, we're going to play some more over the next month, um, continuing with our Gettysburg theme, because Pennsylvania is quite proud of Gettysburg. Um, at least it's, it's ghost content, and the fact that it did turn the tide of the American Civil War and stop Lee from going into D.C. And what's amazing is my doctor has a theory and that Lee would have won Gettysburg if he hadn't been in heart failure. Hmm. Because it caused a lot of confusion, um, the lack of oxygen into his brain, and he was actually quite ill, and he wasn't carrying out proper strategy. Hmm. So, you know, a lot of little medical glitches. But we have one from June 16, 2012. You want to set this one up a little bit for us? Oh, uh, yeah. My neighbor at the time, um, him and his adoptive son, you know, we're always interested in the paranormal, and, and we went out to Saks Bridge. So anyway, when we arrived at Saks Bridge, there were some teens there with a couple of adults watching what they were doing, make sure they didn't get, didn't get hurt. And they, they were working with an EMF detector meter on the bridge. So we decided to go into the woods at first, and we are in the woods, and I slipped in the mud. That's a different story for another time. And we came back to the bridge, and we hung around and listening to the kids that asked questions, and they were getting stuff with their EMF detector. And this mm-hmm. one, one of the kids asked, um, is the spirit of a little girl here? And you get her response. So I'm going to play that now. Let me... So that's the response you got. Yes. And the little girl. So you've got another one here. July 7th, uh, 2008. I think this was like the four, third or fourth what time I it? took Chris down to here. Gettysburg. Here. And, you know, Chris being at a, a teenager, he found himself a couple dates. Well, sort of dates. There were other teenagers there that could drive. And, of course, Chris being Chris, wandered off into the woods with him. With them. And I was talking to two adults that were there. You can hear us talking this inside, set the recorder down, and we're talking, and you can hear the voice of a woman say, I think the boy is coming, and sure enough, he came running across the bridge with the four girls. Those are really cool, Tom. Thanks for joining, you know, with us, coming down with us and hanging out with Mark Nesbitt today, and we're going to start winding this up. I know Mark's got to get ready to go down to New Orleans, and Phil, I think you had some final questions for Mark. Oh, I just wanted to ask him a couple more things. Uh, you have seven books total of The Ghost of Gettysburg? Right? The Ghost of Gettysburg, yeah. Do you have, uh, is there an eighth one we can look forward to? Working on it now. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm finally getting a chance to, because I had written probably four, three or four others in between the, the last uh, Ghost of Gettysburg and then this one, so I'm finally getting around to it. Great, great. And your, your first book, actually, ever was a children's book, correct? Yeah. It called yeah. A Little Drummer Boy? Correct. Cool. Um, have you ever thought of potentially, maybe sometime in the future or whatever, doing uh, another children's book about ghosts or spooky tales for the younger readers? One of these, I often said, one of these days when I'm, I've, I've gotten enough experience, I'll write a kid's book <laughs> again. <laughs> you know, but uh, I don't know. It'd be kind of a, there hasn't been a ghost, or it hasn't been a, 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 a a Civil War history book on Gettysburg in a long time since right. I was a child. Right. So maybe it might be fun to do a ghost book. That would be. Kids. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they're, they're good sellers, you know? Yeah. Certainly something, Phil, you would have appreciated. Yes, yes. I, oh, my God. When I was a kid, I was uh, reading 
reading his Halloween kid books all the time, you know. <laughs> Whatever gets kids interested in Gettysburg, yeah, I think is important. That's you know, teaching history through folklore mm-hmm. is one of the is a very important thing, and I think that we can do it. I completely agree. And um, this this building itself is haunted, yeah. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We have uh, well, Mrs. Kitzmiller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have the Georgia soldiers that were here. We have Hank mm-hmm. and uh, a little boy. Too, we know, and we have photographs of them too. We, we've got a ghost story that you wrote called "Ghost Tour Headquarters," mm-hmm. you know, read by David Walton, our British folk singer. And I guess we need to start closing up the show, even though it's been wonderful sitting here talking ghosts with you on "What Are You Afraid of?" Par and Paranormal Show. And you can find more information about Mark Ghosts of Gettysburg Candlelight Tours at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. I know Halloween is popular for Gettysburg, but they do, you do this all year round. Correct. Every every day is Halloween for mm-hmm. us, <laughs> and it's just it's just a haunted house in here. You come in every day is Halloween. Yeah, mm-hmm. here at, at Ghosts of Gettysburg. And you were telling us that this is uh, you leave this up all year round. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, this is our this is our decor. That's wonderful. I and, love it. And if you like the show and you're listening on our audio version, we are editing and putting out the video version, which will be the first time we've really done video on our you know Facebook, YouTube. And also at www.whatareyoufraidofpodcast.com as part of our countdown to Halloween 2017. Philadelphia is horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Philadelphia is horror. Right. <laughs> yeah. we've, been, we've been attacked by clowns. We had Darcy Orr from Fort Mifflin. We had our reading at Fort Mifflin. And we're going to be at Pennhurst. Katrina Weidman's coming on the show. And movie guy, Lloyd Kaufman. That's going to be an incredible interview. Lloyd. So we're, we're looking forward to that. J. Lee Dodson's on clowns. So. Finally, last question: What would you say is the most haunted location in Gettysburg? Mm. Well, that's a I know good, it's a tough one. That's a good question <laughs> because you know, believe it or not, I hear different places every year. It changes. Oh, okay. It changes, oh, uh, so it's not always one place. But let me let me just say this: the place that you can go, a couple of places you can go that probably are consistently active mm-hmm. would be Devil's Den, mm-hmm. and right next to it, the Triangular Field. Yeah, those yeah. are two two real hot spots. Uh, Saks Bridge is also uh, pretty active, but the problem with that is everybody's heard of it, and you can go out there and it's like a, a, a party. It's like right. yeah. <laughs> so I think that's almost impossible to get anything out there. Right. But those are the two I would, and of course the, the Devil's Den and, and, and uh, Triangular Field are getting that way too. But yeah, Spangler so. Spring is that one? Is that high on the Spangler Spring is also uh, that was the one a couple of years ago. I heard a lot of stories mm-hmm. about, it. and it's a little less visited because it's off kind of off the. Battlefield tour, right? Great. great. Maybe we'll go check that out. Yeah, 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 definitely. Mark, thank you so much for being yes, on the show you, again. An, another year, and we come down, and this is a wonderful shop, and hopefully we'll we'll get some footage of it. You know, we can put up with the video. And you've been incredible. I want to thank you so much for coming and telling us your wonderful ghost stories, and I hope you have many more years before you cross over and we start writing ghost stories about you. (laughs) Well, thank you, Fox. I appreciate that. This is T. Fox Dunham. We're coming in live. Well, we were coming in live and dead. (laughs) From Ghosts of Gettysburg, Candlelight Tours in Gettysburg. It is now the second day of fall, November 23rd. We're moving into Halloween 2017, coming into October. Our favorite time of the year. Thanks, Phil, for coming out. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Fox. It was was a great show. Yeah. This is Fox. This is Phil. This is Mark. And we will see you next week on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show, celebrating our countdown to Halloween. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Ghosts of Gettysburg Tour Headquarters from Ghosts of Gettysburg 7 by Mark Nesbitt of Gettysburg read by David Walton From nearly the first day the Ghosts of Gettysburg Tour Company bought the Civil War era house on the corner of Baltimore and Breckenridge Streets strange, unexplainable events have been occurring Doors have been opened by some unseen helpful hand for workmen repairing the house. Some have speculated it is the ectoplasmic hand of Jacob Heck, who owned the carriage trimmer shop in the oldest section of the building. One labourer helping out another across death's door. 
Children have been heard, seen and felt, rattling a restroom doorknob, appearing in the stairway, or in a paranormal investigator's photo, pulling on an employee's sweater, or pushing a customer out of a door. Communications have been established with a former owner as well as the soldiers from Georgia and Louisiana who once occupied this section of town, building a rubble barricade across Baltimore Street where it hits Breckenridge. They speak freely on digital recorders, resulting in electronic voice phenomena, EVP, the voices of the dead recorded. They utilize instrumental transcommunication, ITC, operating various electronic instruments such as phones or computers to reveal the secrets denied to us by their deaths. But one recent event piqued the curiosity of a veteran guide and frightened an entire tour and their leaders. On a weekend in late April 2010, Amy, our guide with the most years with the company, was leading a group of 8th graders and their chaperones on a tour. Towards the end of the tour it began to thunderstorm. The group was close enough to the tour headquarters that, even though the building was closed, she could use the covered porch for her last few stories. Amy's stories were dramatically punctuated by flashes of lightning. The following series of emails from Amy will explain what happened best. Quote, we made it through the thunder and lightning storm, just wondered who was that stomping through the ghost office when we were in the courtyard. Someone who wanted to go home? If it was a ghost, it was a loud, insistent ghost. Got the group going. End of quote. The email was referred to me by Katie, our manager, who assured me that when the storm hit and Amy and her group were on the porch, she had locked up the office and set the alarm. I wrote back to Amy, telling her that no one had been inside the house when she had arrived, and asked what it sounded like. In her return email, she admitted that she thought maybe it was an employee trying to scare them into leaving the porch. But whatever it was seemed to be able to appear, vanish and reappear in a different place, virtually instantly, stomping its feet persistently. Quote, At first it sounded like they were in the guide room, kitchen, behind the door, but then the insistent steps seemed to stomp back and forth across the length of the pre-1880 downstairs. As we were all reacting, and I wondered what to do, stay or go, the sound changed as if whoever had very quickly gone upstairs and was now stomping rather insistently and very loudly overhead, back and forth on the balcony. I couldn't see anyone up there, and I didn't hear any doors open. The whole change of position happened so quickly. It sounded like somebody wanted us out of there, that they had had enough. We were annoying them and we had to go. I looked to a couple of chaperones and one said simply, let's go. End of quote. Keith Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Books, a major motion picture based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was recently released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox has a story in the Stargate anthology, Points of Origin, from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Mercy was recently released by Bloodbound Books. Fox is an active member of the Harvard Association. 
He's been published in hundreds of short stories and articles, and his motto is Wrecking Civilization One Story at a Time. Phil Thomas resides in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is an author and filmmaker. His screenplays have been produced into feature films such as False Face and Always From Darkness that are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon On Demand. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.